I am the light of the world. This is what Jesus says in John the 8th chapter. If there ever was a dichotomy, or if you want to put it that way, a contradiction that we see throughout history, it is light and darkness. In Genesis 1 verses 3 and 4, we just want to go there for a moment. In the beginning, when the creation has taken place, Genesis 1 verses 3 and 4, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And that light is not figurative. We're not speaking about the sun. He's talking about a different type of light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And it's interesting that in this instance, Moses is writing down that God says the light was good, but he doesn't say that about darkness. He divides the light from the darkness and calls the light good. Uh, and uh, we think of darkness in terms of a negative light. Darkness means danger. Uh, there are two stories. If we were to look in there, remember Lot, how the two angels come from speaking with Abraham. They come down to Sodom. And in the evening, they are out in the town square, whatever it might be. And a mob rises up to take these two men, if they can, and do wicked things with them. And uh, that happens at night. And then later on, when uh, a Levite is coming with his concubine and two servants or one servant, whatever it was, they came into uh, one of the cities uh, of Benjamin. The same idea happens again, same thing. At night it takes place. Uh, so we view darkness that it can be a time of danger. Of course, if you're with your wife and having a romantic evening out for a dun uh, dinner or something, it's a wonderful time. But uh, darkness we can view as, as can be a dangerous time. In uh, the Security Magazine, which analyzes police reports, most murders and the majority of violent crime takes place after sunset. Proverbs, the seventh chapter, if we were to read that seventh chapter, it talks about a woman who is a very uh, uh, adulterous woman, if I can call her that. She goes and meets a guy when it's dark. Uh, if we were to look at the movies made in Hollywood, do you remember, if you look back at old movies, I don't really do that, but westerns, especially back in the 40s, Always they would have the bad guy wearing what color hat, yeah. right? And the good guy's hat was white. Why did they do that? For people to see, here's the good guy, there's the bad guy. And you'd always see that coming in, okay, well that's got to be the bad guy because he's wearing that, that hat. Uh, what about Star Wars? When you go back into the 80s and then the 90s, there was something called the Force, right? Uh, Luke Skywalker, if you look at him the first time you see him, what color is he wearing? White. And what color is Darth Vader? Black. So we can see throughout, and if you would go into the old pagan religions of history, they always have this fight taking place between good and bad, between light and darkness. Uh, and there's a, something I'm going to read from the Dead Sea Scrolls about the wars of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. Now, you know, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, this one is from the 2nd century B.C. And the Essenes were those people that were uh, in that one commune or whatever you wanted to call it. But in the war rule discovered in... Cave 1 of Qumran in 1947 is a manual for military organization strategy. It is a theological discourse that develops the doctrine of the spirits of truth and perversity. So you've got two different uh, uh, groups here. And uh, between the forces of good and evil involves heavenly as well as earthly soldiers. The elect of Israel are joined by an angelic host while the devil and the evil angels fight alongside other nations of the earth. 
the victory of the forces of light was to signal the final destruction of evil after which the God of Israel would rule in eternal justice. So you've got way back then the sons of light against the sons of darkness taking place. Uh, Jesus came to be the light of the world because by the time Jesus comes and even well before that time mankind develops we have God showing us light and darkness. But what does man do? He creates a gray area. He, create, he muddies the water. So we don't know what's good and what's bad anymore. We as humans, we're, we fear darkness because it's the unknown. If, if I'm by my, uh, in the backyard with Bella going to do her business and there's a rustle in the trees, that's going to catch my attention because I don't know what's back there. And guess what? In the daytime, we can see. But in the dark, it's harder to view what's going on. So, uh, and the word obscurity, I was thinking about that word this morning, obscurity. And the definition for obscurity is the state of not being known to many people. Obscurity. Are we, as people who follow Jesus, obscure persons in our generation? Do people know what we stand for? If we're walking down the street and someone points at you and says, that's a Christian, they stand up for what is right. Or are we in a generation of people where we don't know what we stand for anymore? If we are going to be followers of Jesus, we need to be seen as holy and righteous people, not because we are, but because Jesus living in us. We've got too much in our generation of darkness. And brethren, darkness is accepted more than light. So we need to be people of righteousness, people of the light. You know why people hated Jesus? Because when he walked this earth, he showed us what we looked like. And especially the Pharisees, they hated that. He would call them greedy. Matthew 23, he calls them brood of vipers and every other name in the book. Why? Because they look to be people of light. And remember he calls them whited sepulchers. You're dead men's bones. And yet people would look at him and say, oh, look at the righteous people that are walking this earth. And Jesus says, that's not what I see. When the world sees us as a church, when the world sees us as individuals, will they see the light of Jesus in our lives. John 8 verse 12. John 8 verse 12. Brethren, if there is ever a time when people need to be a light in the world, it's you and I. We need to be out there shining for Jesus. And if people see us, we have no light. But if people see Jesus shining in our lives, then we are a light in the world. Aren't we supposed to be like a city that shines? Are we? Because if we are not showing people that there's a difference between good and evil, what are they going to base their morality on? We don't know. Well, whatever you feel like, that's, that's good enough for you. There is a difference between light and darkness. John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am what? The light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So, you know what that means to me in one sense? We ought to be defining what is right and wrong. And not, well, we're going to take this position to safe position. We know that this is right and this is wrong. But you know what? We don't want to hurt people's feelings. So we're going to take this more tolerant, liberal position in the middle. God doesn't give us that ability. We are either light or we're not. And I want to challenge us. There's a philosophical movement afoot in which light and darkness are not different from each other anymore. You go into Hinduism and there isn't any difference. You go into a lot of people's ideas today of what is right and wrong. We don't have that position anymore. According to Hindu and New Age beliefs, light and darkness are the same thing. I don't want to be called evil. Just our perspectives are not correct. That's what they'll tell us. Isaiah the 5th chapter verse 20. Isaiah 5 verse 20. Brethren, we better shine as lights. 
Because that's what Jesus is looking for. And you know what that reminds me of? Remember Matthew 25, the first 13 verses there? You had five ladies that had their light shining and other five ladies, what was happening to their oil and their lamps? It was going out. And I believe, brethren, if we don't watch as Christian people, our lights are going to go out. Have you got the container that holds light? Sure you do. Where's the oil in that light? So brethren, we need to be shining out for Jesus. At the, uh, Isaiah 5 verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put what? Darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is the generation. There is no good anymore. Abortion is okay. That's what we're told. The Democratic Party, that's what our president says to us. I am going to fight for abortion rights for the people and for the people of our nation. What is that? You're fighting for what? Are you fighting for right and the light and the righteousness? Or are you fighting for darkness? We ought to be able to say to the president or anyone else in our country, abortion is wrong. Why? Because God gives life. We do not give. The Democratic Party, the Republican Party, they don't give us the intrinsic value that God gives us, that we are worth because He gives us that value. So, uh, brethren, we need to stand up for that and say, this is wrong. It's not politically correct or incorrect. It's right or wrong. Jesus came to set the story straight. Man is a sinner. We don't want to hear that either, right? Man needs a Savior. We don't want to hear that at all. Man's good works will not save him. And if we refuse the gift of salvation, we will die because we have fallen short of the glory of God. You know, when we think about uh, the scripture, when Paul is telling us that God is molding us into the image of his son, you know what that also entails? We become light to a dark world. When I go on my prayer walk, in the, uh, and right now because it's dark in the morning, I go at 5, and when I come back home, we have lights out on the front uh, of our house when we go into the driveway. And I always see that light, and that reminds me, Lord, help me to be a light that shines in a dark place. That's what we need to be. Amen. People don't need to see an obscure light where, is that really a light or what is that? I want to be Jesus shining in the world. That's what we need to be, brethren. These simple statements that no longer man is a sinful creature. Who is telling us this? Who is teaching our children that there's no male or female anymore? It is what you want to be. I read in Genesis that God created male and female. And that all because you feel like a woman someday doesn't mean you change to be a woman. We need to realize there's righteousness and there's light and we need to be in there. So, and you know what? But you talk to people in colleges these days and they'll think you're from way out in Left Park somewhere. So we need to be working in this world. We need to be living as light. Uh, we like to muddy the water and I'll give you a few statements on that. I think you've got five statements in there. There are these statements that muddy the waters. What are they? Number one, or A on your list, if you got that, many ways to salvation. You don't need Jesus. If you find, uh, just like uh, our prime minister in Canada, he's not my prime minister, I'm in Canada, I'm not in Canada anymore. He says, Hinduism. This, this is a way to salvation. You can be a Buddhist, you can be a Muslim, you can be all these other things. I read in my Bible there's only one who came with the light. And that's Jesus Christ. There's only one way. Remember Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by who? By himself. He is the light of the world. B. We're told there are many ways to God besides Jesus. So there's many ways of salvation. I can be saved by doing good works. I can be saved by uh, uh, reincarnation. I can be saved. There is only one way. And then many ways to God. I just mentioned that. We can go to Hinduism or Muslim faith, whatever it is. There is only one way. Number uh, C, sin can be taken care of without the need of the cross. That's what we're being told nowadays. You don't need Jesus to die. D, 
Well, I guess you're, if you're writing these down, I'm going to quick. I'm sorry, should I go slow down here? Okay, A was many ways to salvation. B is many ways to God besides Jesus. C, sin can be taken care of. You don't need a cross. You don't need Jesus dying. And especially the new age, you are God. You are your own salvation. That muddies the waters. Guess what? We're turning darkness into light now. Remember there's a scripture in, in 1 Corinthians. I forget exactly where it is. Don't, if I can just paraphrase it. Don't be amazed that Satan can trans... trans... okay, himself into an angel of light. Is that happening today? Sure it is. Why does the media show that when you have two groups one is defending the right for life and the other one is defending uh, the right to abortion. Why is it they always make the pro-abortion people look normal and they make the Christian people look like these radical leftists or these weirdos that the government needs to come down on? Why do they always do that? Why is it that 80 to 90 percent of all uh, people who are in the clergy in a movie somewhere are always seen in a negative light? Who's doing this? Who is telling the people that all these ministers are either adulterers or they're stealing your money or they're hypocrites or something like that? Who is telling them this is what happens? So you've got Satan who transforms himself into an angel of light and his ministers. That's why we need to shine the true light. And then E, God loves us just the way we are. We don't need to be saved. Because God just loves us the way we are. No matter what we've done. Let's go to Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 14 to 16. Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. And you know, I was talking to my wife yesterday. I was looking through scriptures. I cannot believe, I mean, I need to believe. There are so many instances in the Bible, especially in Isaiah, I was looking, where there is the... Uh, um, you have light versus darkness. I'm thinking of a word, but I can't get it right now. So many places it speaks about that. Uh, Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. Actually, you know what? Let's go with verse 13 to start. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt have lost his savior, savor wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast down to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. What does that mean? If we don't have a salt that is different from the way the world is, there's no use for us. Amen. So let's go to verse 14. You are what? Amen. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Do we shine? Are we shining? And I'm not talking about self-righteous. I'm talking about a Jesus who loves through us. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. What does it say now? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's who we should be. They ought to be able to look and say, that person is different, and I know why, because I see their life. They are a light. Or you can say, Paul would never do that. Paul would never say that. Or Lloyd would never go racing down 90 miles an hour down the road. That wasn't Lloyd. Why? Because they're living for God. They wouldn't do things. Not like that. So when we are told that we are going to be a light that shines in a dark place and we are to shine for people, they need to see because you know what? I'm convinced when people are evil, and don't understand the light. They hate the light. But you know what? We need to show them that the light is life. I am trying to find a scripture. And I'm not going to find it right now. Anyways, in, in Isaiah, I was amazed at how many times we have that light brought to the forefront. In 1 Thessalonians 5, let's go there for a moment. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 and 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. I was amazed going through scriptures. I was going in my, uh, my uh, software on the computer. How many times 
light and darkness are being talked about and that we need to be the light. People need to see that there is light out there. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 and 5. And I'll get there soon enough. Okay, 4 and 5. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of what? Are you a light today? And the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. There's a difference there. Paul says, you're not in darkness. You're not blinded. You know, brethren, when we come to people who come and say, we've got a new truth for you and we're going to show you this, that the people that are only saved on Tuesday are going to get into the eternal kingdom. You say, what? That's not truth. We've got to be able to stand up and have this light shining in us. Brethren, we are not to be in the darkness. We're not to obscure our lights. The Apostle Paul provides clarity. We are not living in a gray time. You're light. Gray is for people who try to justify sinful actions. And they won't make it either. We're not called to be gray, but to be righteous, to be holy, and that means children of light. Ephesians 5 verse 8. Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Ephesians 5 verse 8 For you were sometimes darkness. Did you get that? Is that possible? How is it that people beforehand believed abortion was good then they come to Jesus and they take a stand against it? Why? Because the light of life has come in. But you were sometimes darkness but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of what? That's the way we should walk. That means people be able to see and look at you and say, they are walking a moral life because they've got someone in them. And that's Jesus Christ our Lord. How about Romans 13 verse 12? Romans 13 and verse 12. And brethren, I was looking through all these scriptures. There are so many scriptures that we can go where it's talking about light versus darkness. Romans 13 and verse 12. And I like this scripture. Romans 13 verse 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of what? Darkness. And let us put on the what? Armor. Armor of light. That is what I want to be wearing. Robes of righteousness too. I want God to be able to look on me and I want to be able to come on judgment day and see his righteousness on me. That light that shines in a dark place. I don't want to be a worker in, in, in darkness. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 7. And we're going to get five points out of this one. 2 Corinthians, I mean sorry, yeah, 2 Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 7. Second Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 7. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, what is it? As we have received mercy, we faint not. But we have renounced the what? Hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, look at verse 3. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost, or in other versions says, those who are perishing, those who are dying. We need to be a light, because there are people who are dying without Jesus, and we need to show that we have a light. We have a reason to live. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not see. Why do you say people can't understand when you talk about the Ten Commandments? Or why is it that sometimes you can have family members and you can't get along with them anymore? Because when they're walking blind in darkness, it is against light. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds, that's what happens, of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, is that light shining through us? Who is the image of God should shine unto them. That's what we're supposed to be doing. As a light that shines in a dark place, it speaks about prophecy. 
For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the what? To shine out of darkness. That is who we are now. Has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What is it? His light. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Do you know why some people get into obscurity and their light doesn't shine anymore? Because they think they're the light. Or, or some ministers will be up in the pulpit. They feel like they don't need God to anoint their services anymore. They're pretty smart. They can do it on their own. We need to be open vessels for Jesus to shine His light out on so the five points I wanted to get out of 2 Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 7. Number one, Paul says we all have this ministry. And then what is that ministry is? Being a light that shines in a dark place. Being a light for people that are perishing. We have this ministry. It's given to us to shine. Not when we want to. You know, I remember back in, in college days in Canada, we had this... Uh, uh, play we put on. Boy, we had a lot of kids there. We had about 2,000, 3,000 kids from all over Canada that came uh, to the Canadian Bible College. And it was Journey Underground. And that is Christians were beginning to hide their light so that the world was darkness. We need to be a light so people can see that Jesus is here. Amen. So we have this ministry. We need to shine. Number two, that was verse number one. Verse two gives us the characteristics of light. When we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, we're no longer lying, right? We're telling the truth. Not walking in craftiness. We don't cheat people. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But here is where the truth comes in. But manifesting the manifestation of the truth, conveying ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We're walking in truth. We're not telling lies. We're not doing these things anymore. Yeah, the, the sad thing is, is when someone says to you, I don't know if you're a Christian or not because you're not telling the truth or you're doing this. That's horrible. That obscures the light. Verses 3 to 5. Do people see us or do people see Jesus? That's the question. Because if people see me and my attitudes and not Jesus transforming me into a son of God then I've got a problem. Amen. Then they'll say, that church is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. So you know, do you know what you say to people when they're doing that? Why should I go to church when there's a bunch of hypocrites? You say, one more won't change anything. Invite them to come on in. So Jesus tells us we must not hide the gospel. We must live the gospel. Right? Verse 3, but if our gospel is hidden, it is hid from those who are lost or who are dying. And because we've got the enemy making the church like look like evil, right? And he makes evil look good. So we've got to shine out so people say, there is a difference. There is a difference in our country. Jesus is that difference. And then for point number four, so point number three, verses three to five, do people see us or do they see Jesus? Point number four, is verse 6, and it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. He commanded that. That means that light should shine through us. Has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When Jesus is in us, our lights are going to shine. It's just natural. It's going to happen. And then verse 7, for point number 5, what is the treasure? Jesus dwelling in your heart. That's the treasure. That's the light that people need to see. And brethren, we need to be that light because darkness is getting worse in our country all the time. 1 John 1 verses 5 to 7. 1 John 1, John 1 verses 5 to 7. First John 1 verses 5 to 7. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is what? 
and in him is no darkness at all. What does that mean? You can trust God for what he says. He's, he never lied, never will, can't lie. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. That's where the idea of obscurity comes into play. If we say that we're a Christian, but people see us lying, what happens to us? Then, then uh, people look and say, well, if that's Jesus, or if we're not gentle and loving with other people, oh, well, that's your Jesus, and you call yourself a Christian? Our light shines and we show the love of God. Verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, you get that? How do we walk in the light? There's three things. That, number one, be in prayer. God, help me that your light's going to shine through me and people are going to see a difference between a sinner and a Christian. Not that we're judging the sinners, but that we want to show the light of the light of the world, of life. Be in the Word. This is how we understand what the light is, brethren. And number three, be obedient to the working of the Spirit of God. So, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Do you mean to tell me that people in the church should be friendly to one another? And love one another? Ooh, okay. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Brethren, if we have the witness that Jesus has forgiven our sins, then we have a light that shines in the world. I don't have to go to theology school or seminary to learn how to let my light shine. I just have to let God shine in my life. Amen. Okay, God, not my will, but your will be done. That's how His light shines. This then is a message that we have heard of Him, and we declare unto you that God is light. Are we light? There are enough people out there walking in darkness that it's time that we start to show what the light looks like. And we ought not to hide that light. Remember how Jesus, and we took them before, you don't light a candle and put it under the bed. What for? You're going to start a fire. You put a light in the middle of the room so whoever comes in sees that light. And we're not trying to boast, oh, I'm a Christian, so everyone look at me. I believe when you're living for God, that light shines naturally for people. And you learn to love people naturally. I've got a couple minutes. I hadn't thought about this, but let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to end with that. 1 Corinthians 13. Do you know what that light looks like? Let's take a few other characteristics here. And I hadn't put them down, but I think this might work for us. 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, thank you to all those pe people who just said right now, into their breath, please, Preacher, keep praying. I preach, preach for us, so I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, and can I put in there light as well? Because love is light. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You know there are people that are trying to shine lights on themselves. Look how good I am. Remember, didn't Jesus say that about the Pharisees? They do these works to be seen of men. Verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries, mysteries, sorry, and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not light, I'm putting light and love in there. I am nothing. If our light doesn't shine, brethren, what are we doing? And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, I want to get the idea here. Our light shines when love shines through our life. Love suffers long and is kind. You know, it's, it's a sad day when a person sees a mean Christian. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself, is not puffed up. And there's nothing worse also than a prideful Christian. Look how smart I am. I've got uh, this master of divinity uh, behind my name, so look how smart I am. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. That shines your light. Does it bother us when we see people doing, uh, being involved and saying, well, I'm a, I'm a moral person, but I believe that we can go and abort children, no problem. Is that truth? 
rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And I love this verse 7. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Do you want to look like a Christian who's shining in the light? We need these characteristics. Oh, I don't believe so and so could do that. He's a better person than that. Love never fails. And I want to say the light never fails. But where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. But when there's love and light shining through your light, uh, your life, you're going to have a light that shines. So we need to have these characteristics in our lives because then people see that light of Jesus in our life. Father in heaven, thank you that you sent Jesus to be the light of the world. Father, you know there were many people who didn't want to see that light. We read in John, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But to those who accepted Jesus, He gave them the power to become the sons of God. Lord, we want to be a living son and daughter of God. And we want that light to shine because, Lord, we are in a land of dread darkness. We want to shine and show that there is a light, there is a Jesus, there is a Savior. And He is not being hidden because He's shining through our lives. So, Lord, bless and be with us, Father. Help us to be that city, that light of the city that shines on a hill so other people can see you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.